Uh, I'm going to present the joint project, project of Margaret and I. We are going to switch uh, uh, between the price of one. Uh, it's still a, a work, a very much a, a work in progress. So some of those, some parts are more well developed than others, as we will see. And uh, so we value your uh, comments. So uh, we call it zoom in, zoom out in copyright. And here's what we are going to talk about. First, we are going to tell you what we mean when we say zoom in, zoom out. Where, what is zooming? As, as, at least as we use it. Then I'm going to try to convince you that it's really important. It's an important question we should care about, the, the zooming question. And then we spend some time about example where it comes out and, and, and what do we do this. So let's start with the first one. Well, what is zooming? So I want to use an example that's, oh, you can't see. Oh, <laughs> Believe me, it looks way better on my computer. Uh, that's the ceiling, well, I'll describe it. Uh, that's the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. That's the masterpiece created by, by Michelangelo. And I can ask myself, okay, is this the point of reference that I care about when I talk about copyright? Is this what we should care about? Is this entire masterpiece the relevant point of reference? Option one, we call it zoom out. But option two, we can sort of look inside. And when we look inside, we find this work, which is called The Creation of Adam. It's a very famous work in itself. It's just part of the ceiling. And we call it zoom in. So maybe this is the right point of reference for all those copyright doctrines that we are going to talk about in a few minutes. And so this is zoom in, this is zoom out, but it's not just binary, there are more options there. For example, here's the creation of Adam, but maybe this is the point of reference. This is famous in itself, right? The two finger touching, that's famous in itself. Maybe this is the correct point of reference for a, a copyright law. So uh, generally speaking, what we are saying is that uh, this question comes out in, in many, many copyright law doctrines. Uh, we'll talk about some of them, substantial similarity, etc., damages, administration, fair use, and, and many more uh, doctrines that we have about it. So first, let me convince you that we, we, you should care about that, and we should care about that. Uh, why, why does it matter? It, it matters because it turns out that when you look at uh, many, many cases, the outcome of those cases is determined by our point of reference, by the point of reference that the court take actually determine the outcome of that case. And when you look at those cases as a collective, that actually determines a huge, huge chunk of what we call the scope of copyright protection. There are policies at play here when you make that determination that we need to be aware of. Let's briefly mention them. When you excessively zoom in, you said, I'm pointing in to a small, small chunk of, 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 of unit, and I say, this is the relevant uh, point, you are really, really stress, uh, give the copyright owner a very strong protection. You are shrinking the public domain by doing that, because the, the copyright owner has a much more strong copyright. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And you also lead to fragmentation. Now there is chunk, chunk, chunk of unit, and each one of them has its own copyright string attached to it. And now, to look at the work as a whole, we have transaction cost problems. So that's what happens when you really, really zoom in at one extreme. On the other extreme, you really, really want, if you really, really zoom out, you see other problems. Now you are weakening, you are really weakening the copyright law protection. Now you are frustrating all the interest that we think. We, the reason we have copyright, right? If we, if we think that we have copyright for incentive, if we create a very weak copyright, then we are weakening those incentives. And you're also uh, maybe uh, unfairly punishing those people who create complex work. Uh, does Michelangelo have to suffer because instead of creating the creation of Adam at a standalone work, he painted the entire Sistine Chapel? Maybe that's something that uh, we don't want. So we find that the current natural tendency of the copyright system in the US as it exists is that copyright owners generally want to argue for zooming in as much as possible because that gives them more works and that gives them more rewards in areas like statutory damages, in areas like fair use, etc. Um, but only up to the point of validity, right? So if you zoom in too far, you hit an originality problem. Um, and what we find is that when you look at the statutory framework for all of this, uh, we are not the first people to observe this, the word, word work is not defined in the Copyright Act. So there is not really a statutory framework for trying to figure out whether you should take the zooming out perspective or the zooming in perspective. We also find that after formalities, again, we're not the first to say this, after formalities that were eliminated, um, you end up in a situation where authors can kind of do whatever they want uh, at the point of claiming infringement or whatever part of copyright reduction they're in. Um, and registration is a huge mess on the issue. We'll come back to this. 
So our work uh, is contrasted with other works on work. Yes, you're welcome. I used the work three times in that sentence. Um, <laughs> is more about zooming in the way that Brad was talking about his piece. It's more about zooming as a framing decision that judges make, or regulators make, or legislators make. It's not about defining a work. Because we find if you sit in a place where you're just defining the work, you run into the fact that the copyright statute has no definition of the work, and you also don't get to reach a bunch of the areas of doctrine that we find this judicial framing move takes place in. Um, so what we've found initially, and we've only sort of at this point gone over a couple of doctrinal areas, is that courts often set the level of zoom without noticing that they're setting a level of zoom. Um, when they do set the level of zoom and they know they're doing it, they often do it without any kind of principled reasoning. And when they are in our best case scenario, they've set the level of zoom, they know they're doing it, and they've adopted a test, they adopt different tests across different doctrines and different tests even within the same doctrine. So Guy is going to start with example one of that problem. So statutory damages, is, 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 in some respects, is a relatively well-developed area in this, in this question. And the reason is that the, the law tells you you have a choice as a copyright uh, prosecutor, as a copyright uh, owner, to decide whether you want to have statutory damages. And then the damage are pay work. So that immediately brings the question, OK, what is the right reference point? So think about the situation, the defendant copies several episodes of one TV series, or several songs, or several images from a book, and now the court has to decide how many awards do we have here, one or several. Uh, the leading case about that is, is Gamma Audio, which dealt with uh, this, the Jade Fox, which is, you can see, it's a <laughs> Chinese soap opera, and the defendant copied four episodes of the Chinese soap opera, and the court had to decide, okay, how many awards do we give you, four, one per episode, zooming in, or one per the series, because this was just part of a series. The court, the First Circuit in that case, decided four. And the reason is a test that uh, we, uh, the court called the Independent Economic Value Test. And the court says, we need to ask ourselves whether the zooming work, the episode, the song, each one of them can live its own copyright life and have its own independent economic value. If that's the case, then we'll zoom in and you get one per individual unit. Uh, there are factors for that determination. Gamma Court uh, said two factors. The first one is, can each episode be consumed separately? So the question, can it zoom in one? So the question is, can, an, can a TV episode be rented on its own? Can a song, an individual song, can be bought on its own? So that's the first part of the test. The second question that the court asked uh, ask itself is, were they produced separately? Look at what happened when they created, where they created in separate process for its one process. Other courts develop other variations thereof, and one of the important ones is registration. Let's look at registration. We'll talk about registration in two minutes and see why that doesn't work very well. Uh, so that's a very, very widely used test, but not all. There is a competing test, and the competing test coming from the Second Circuit, it's called Bryant, and uh, Bryant dealt with uh, two uh, foundations of uh, modern uh, culture. One is called uh, Song for Dogs, and the other one is Song for Cat. So uh, those two masterpieces has 10 songs each, and the defendant, I don't know if you find 20 songs of that, but <laughs> and the defendant copied it. Why? I don't know. Uh, uh, but now we are in court and we are arguing how many awards do we give? Two or 20? And the court, the Second Circuit says, you know, I'm going to zoom out. I'm going to count each album as one. So instead of getting 20 awards, you get only two. The Second Circuit explicitly said, I know other court used in the economic value test, and I reject that. I reject it because inconsistent with the Copyright Act that tells me that the compilation should get one more. And though I think those are compilation, and therefore what the First Circuit has done is been adopted by most other circuits is inconsistent with the Act. And we have a competing factor to look at. The, the Second Circuit tells us, look at the bundling decision of the copyright owner. If the copyright owner decides when putting this work in the stream of commerce to bundle the zoom in work together, then we are going to zoom out. In other words, when the copyright owner decides to sell 10 songs together, that's that. That's how I know what is the right point of reference. Another important case uh, coming from the South District uh, that says, well, maybe, but not really, because if later on it decides to unbundle, we will honor that. So I release an album to the stream of commerce, and later on I offer the song individually on iTunes. At least the South District of New York says, OK, now we zoom in and get your individual award per song. So we see some mess in the Second Circuit 
And you see a lot of mess when you compare the second circuit with the other uh, circuit. Great. So a number of different both courts and scholars have suggested that we should look to copyright registration as the way of solving this problem. I'm afraid that I have to tell you that this is an absolute mess and doesn't solve the problem at all because registration, um, sorry, registration looks attractive. I want to give you the reason why people think it should solve the problem because it potentially indicates authorial intent. So if you think that the person who gets to define the work is the author, then the author, by registering each individual work as individual works, is getting to express their intent through the registration system. And if what you care about is costs in the system, then requiring the author to individually register individual works at least increases some friction, some costs, in the absence of formalities. So that's why registration is, is attractive. It doesn't work because it contains its own Zoom problem. So many of you might not be familiar with the extraordinarily fascinating line of cases on database registration of stock uh, photographs. But the Ninth Circuit has found that when you register a database of stock photographs, uh, that registration of the database reaches every individual photograph in the database. And SDNY has found the opposite. When you register a group of a database of stock photographs, that registration of the database does not reach each individual uh, photo in the database. So if we go the direction that the Ninth Circuit went, um, which is also the way a number of other circuits went, we find that uh, having the database registration reach individual works when the author doesn't actually have to list the names of the individual works eliminates the reason why registration is an attractive solution, right? Because if you give the author registration when they just list three works and file a database, they're not actually having to indicate authorial intent to register each individual work, and they don't have any transaction costs in actually listing out each individual work as a work. All right, so the Copyright Office has opined on this. Hi, Brad. Um, <laughs> and the new compendium with which I am now probably too familiar uh, also shows how problematic registration is as a solution. Um, first, registration policy actually sometimes conflicts with the statutory damages approach. So the Copyright Office allows for authors to register a CD as one unit of publication, and that unit of publication registration then reaches each individual song, right? That's the opposite of what happened in Bryant, uh, Songs for Dogs, Song for Cats, where bundling them together and distributing them together actually makes the perceived number of works for purposes of statutory damages collapse, right? So you have a mixed message on what bundling does to the number of works. Second, registration policy is actually calibrated against statutory damages. So if in statutory damages we are pointing to registration as our solution, it should be problematic that the Copyright Office is setting registration policy based on what it thinks the results might be in statutory damages cases. Hmm. So we find that uh, for unpublished works, the Copyright Office actually assumes that a group of unpublished works will be re uh, registered individually and not as a compilation. This preserves this default the author, when they register a group, is registering them as individuals, preserves higher statutory damages instead of allowing the author to only claim the statutory damages in the compilation. So again, we have no authorial intent and no friction or cost. It's the Copyright Office setting registration policy against the backdrop of statutory damages. So what we've learned so far, there are multiple inconsistent tests. They're sometimes interdependent. And this is where there are tests at all. So, Guy is going to show uh, a number of areas where, in copyright doctrine, courts do this without having an explicit test, without explaining why they're zooming, and without even knowing that they're zooming. All right, so those are, you would note those are pretty important area of copyright law. Fair use of sense similarity, authorship will slightly short of time, so we'll start to run over them. So we know that fair use, there is a four factor test, and we can talk about how the four factor has a zooming problem. Let's talk about the third, which has an even more obvious zooming problem. The third factor part of it asks us, how much did you take, you the defendant, taken of the work in comparison to the work as a whole? So what does the work as a whole mean in that context? Do we zoom in or zoom out? Let me give you an example of how uh, messy that uh, discussion is. Talk about the, the, the famous photocopying cases. Those are cases in which the fact pattern is similar. Defendant copying massive, massive amount of article found in publication of the plaintiff spread across uh, scientific uh, newsletters, uh, publication. So what, what do we have? The court of claim 
So the question is how much, how, how much, how much big, what is the amount compared to the work as a whole? The point of claim told us in Williams and Wilkins that it's not a lot, it's really little because we compare this article to all the work that was sold by the plaintiff to the defendant. The defendant bought libraries of work, they photocopy very little of it, so we zoom out and said, when you zoom out, it doesn't look that much. Texaco, on the other hand, said, no, 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 each article, let's zoom in, each article is the work as a whole, and if that's the test, then you take an L of it. So you take <coughs> all the work. Uh, Michigan, Michigan Document Service uh, and Bank Decision of the Sixth Circuit says exactly the same. Each article is the whole work, therefore you take in all of it. And recently, Tatum, the Georgia uh, State case, finding between said, you know, the magazine is the relevant reference point, so it's semi-zoom out. So you're taking a lot of it, but not all of it. It's also interesting to know that those are not really well-formed decisions. The first, in the first case, uh, the scholar that completely didn't notice there is an issue, said, okay, this is the reference point, he didn't notice that there is another possibility. Texaco is the only decision out of those four that we are actually ever reasoning, in the sense that the court says, I can choose A, and I can choose B, and I choose A, and this is Y pretty basic you would think you expect from a court, Texaco is the only one. Uh, Michigan Press, again, this is a very long decision, four opinion, three dissent, and the court has zero reason. Uh, it, it doesn't even notice that it's making a choice here. And pattern, pattern is interesting, it actually did notice. In pattern, the court did notice the choice. It says for procedural round, I'm not going to deal with that because it was raised very late in the litigation. So in the litigation, they assume magazine, I'm going to stick with that. So uh, we have this uh, slight mess. What are the factors that are being used? Uh, 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 let's go a bit fast. The factor, and this is not test. Those are random thoughts that came into the judge end while dis discussing fair use cases. One of them says, look at statutory damages, independent economic value test. The other one says, look at the bundling decision of the corporate owner. Look at registration, which we talked about. Or uh, look at whether each article was created by a separate author or the same author. And finally, look at copyrightability. Is each article can be protected by copyright? If it's so, let's zoom in. All right. Very fast. <laughs> yeah. So we had substantial similarity. District Court, Second Circuit says, look at the total and concept feel of the uh, plaintiff's rug versus alleged infringer's rug. Um, Second Circuit, Calabrese says, no, you don't look just at the total concept and feel, you actually zoom in. So we have public uh, domain rug, plaintiff's rug, uh, alleged infringer's rug, public domain has this detail that you're zooming into. Uh, plaintiff's rug has edited out, you can't see this on the slide, has edited out part of it. Um, and the alleged infringer also edited out the same part, and so zooming in gets you a different result, and you actually find that there is uh, potential infringement. All right, that was fast. Thank you. Oh, Cindy Garcia, <laughs> Cindy Garcia, five seconds out of a 30 minute uh, a clip. All right, what do we do here? Cindy Garcia is also a basically a zoom in, zoom out decision. What the majority says, it says, this is one word, I'm zooming out. And if it's one word, then the question is, do, uh, can Cindy Garcia be a joint author? And I think when you apply those tests, the answer, at least the, the, the tests as they are now, no. What Kosinski is doing? Kosinski is not fighting this. Kosinski is saying instead, I'm looking at the five seconds as the relevant reference point. And in those five seconds, maybe, um, let's not open this game of form, maybe Cindy <laughs> Garcia can be the author of those five seconds. And if she can, if I'm zooming in, then each contributor is, is its own author. And uh, the interesting thing is that while the Zoom, what the majority says, we have fragmentation issues in Kosinski's opinion, now they provide you a test. You don't, you don't get the test, why, why are we choosing this or that in this uh, case? Uh, we notice a few other documents that have come about, and we just mentioned them. Notice requirement, revision of collective work. This is the Tassini. 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 Yes, uh, separability analysis after use of article, termination of transfer, and the minimus. All right, so we have questions for you in the remaining four minutes. Um, <laughs> probably don't answer this one, just email us. Uh, where does Zoom appear in other areas of copyright law? We have our playful. Um, other areas of IP, because I don't think it's just a copyright problem. Um, important, should we keep or change the title slash how we're labeling the problem? Um, and scope of the project, right now, a descriptive project is immensely, immensely huge. Do we have to get into a prescriptive part of it? Um, and right now, the focus of our project is on judges. Is it okay to be talking about legislators and legis legislators, or just stay with a focus on judges? Thank you. <laughs> Peter. Oh, sorry, yeah. So, you since you asked about the metaphor and the title, it, it works for it might work for some of it, but you know, zoom in, zoom out is is sort of unidimensional, and some of these problems are set uh, and subset problems, which is a more flexible framework. You know, when you think these pro because it, your problem is related to the problem of defining work, and so anyway, we can talk about it more later. But that's just my quick intuition. Yeah. 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 
so um, I guess that, so, so it, it seems to work. The question is, I guess, whether the project is primarily about an evidentiary one. Is it about the like what you know? How do courts uh, like prove their conclusion? How do and actually how, how do the parties in these cases present the works? Um, and that would seem like that would be zoom in would, would definitely capture that. But if it's something that is more sort of conceptual, the zoom in metaphor may just maybe isn't doing as much work as you want. Um, I actually think that, like looking at the briefs in these cases would kind of help some of your thesis about zoom too much. Okay. Um, so what I think is really interesting is that some works, like songs on an album, right, it's kind of easy to kind of maybe the discrete portion of the album. Whereas if you're talking about a book, right, where when I teach this in copyright, there's the characters, there's the plot that might be infinitely copyrightable. And I think you might want to explore that issue too for certain kinds of works, books, movies, where there might be. And, and so I always talk about like kind of like what you mentioned. Some things might have the ability to be copyrighted independently, and so uh, for, and so then that's going to be relevant not just for is there a valid copyright, right, because you have the, the the uh, you know stereotypical characters that wouldn't be protected, but the whole thing might be protected. Yeah, it sort of talks with the level of abstraction discussion. But I think it's the levels of, of abstraction, yes, yes. That, yes. yes so that, yes, I think you guys yes, might want to explore. I, that. I will say that there are fair use cases in which uh, the defendant copy a page of a book and they start to argue, okay, is this a very small chunk of the big work or is this a work of the Yeah, the Midnight in Paris, the Faulkner that mm -hmm. dispute might be one. Yeah, Matt. thank you. Um, I think you're going to find that there are some approaches to answering this question that have no limiting principle, we're just turtles all the way down. Yes. And so those are probably the wrong ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Mean, is it copyrightable? This is because it's been Garcia, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yes. so that goes to descriptive versus normative, like making claims. There are maybe some normative claims we can agree on. We'll see. <laughs> Brad, David, Brad, and Priscilla. Yes. And I, I, I think it's a great project. I agree with Lisa what she was saying. You know, the, the idea expression dichotomy seems this issue writ large and you're going to want to draw the distinction. You also might want to think about market analysis and fair use, right? To the extent that we're defining nascent or non-existent markets, there's a, at least as you define it, a zoom and zoom and aspect to it, even though it's a different issue because it depends and so forth. Yes. So you may want to draw that distinction as well, but also I think it underscores that this issue of choosing the right subject matter is not just on the prima facie side of copyright law, but pervades the law generally. Yes, I, I agree. And then you have the fourth factor, yeah. tying with the third. Yes, right. I, I, yeah. I agree. Okay, so, so, so if, if, if you can fix the feedback loop problem with registration, tied to registration, and you do take the second circuit approach, I have serious scaling concerns with photographs and newspaper collections and stuff like that. Do you work at the copyright office? I have. <laughs> 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 These are my own personal I'm very, very personal when talking about newspapers, but, but if you had to register each individual article, there's just no way that could be done, not at the cost it costs to register. And so then what you would get, I mean, it would just be a, 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 a whole reproduction of a newspaper, which may not have any value, but let's say it was done, it ends up being one in print, but that doesn't make sense to me. Like, you could license each individual article pretty easily. So, so I, uh, oh, we're out. Oh, we're out. It's really good, too, so. <laughs> 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 <laughs>